in here. All right. Well, we're going to begin with the call to worship that's in uh, the greeting here that's in your bulletin from Psalm 24. And then we will light a candle and all process in. And what I invite you to do is for everybody to walk the entire, if you're able to and comfortable, to walk the entire aisle and then go down the sides uh, before you find your seat. So it just adds a little bit more length to the parade, the procession. Um, and feel free to enthusiastically wave your palms and smile, etc., on this joyful day. Um, all right, so are you ready? All right, well, welcome in the name of the Lord. Our greeting today is from Psalm 24, verse 7 to 10. Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Let us now sing our glory, laud, and honor. And so, so right. <laughs>
be seated if you wish. Welcome in the name of the Lord. My name is Brad Busick. I'm the pastor here at Smith Memorial Presbyterian Church, and we're so glad that you're here with us on this Palm Sunday. We also welcome those who are watching online. We're glad that you are part of our church and our online community as well. Uh, today is, of course, Palm Sunday. It marks uh, the beginning of Holy Week, and in about five days, uh, we will uh, remember how the people changed from waving palm branches to shouting, crucify him, crucify him to Jesus. And uh, so this week, there's a lot of uh, scripture passages to read and contemplate, and it's impossible to do all together in, in a service. Um, so I do want to encourage you when you go home this week to take time to uh, pick one of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John and read the entire uh, Passion narrative so that uh, as you uh, approach Easter next week, that it'll have a little bit more meaning as you experience the, the Passion uh, and the suffering and the death of Christ. Uh, we do have a few opportunities to, to gather as a community uh, for Holy Week. We are again partnering with uh, other congregations, and I think it's a beautiful symbol of coming together with other congregations. On Thursday, which is Monday Thursday, uh, Monday means mandate and reminds us of when Jesus washed his disciples' seat, feet before he shared the Last Supper with them, he gave them a new mandate, a new command, to love one another as I have loved you. And so our Monday Thursday service will be at Gethsemane Lutheran Church, and uh, it will have a potluck lunch, dinner at 6 o'clock, followed by worship at 7. Even if you don't bring food, you're welcome to attend the potluck. If you'd like to bring food, the theme is Middle Eastern, Mediterranean food, or any food that you love that is not pork. Uh, so uh, feel free to contribute something that's not pork to the Monday, Thursday service. And then the uh, service time starts at 7. And I believe eight different churches are working together on that one. For Good Friday, we are going to join Gresham United Methodist Church at 6.30, and it will be a cantata service. So there will be scripture reading, but a lot of singing as, as well. And the weekly email, I think, has the wrong address on that. But it is on 8th Street uh, near Division, across from the Best Buy Shopping Center. So that's where Gresham United Methodist Church is. And that's 630. So on Easter Sunday, we have a early morning sunrise service at 630. And we do this also with other congregations at Camp Manuka in Corbett. And so I just go on the internet and look up Camp Manuka in Corbett. And this is a service that lasts about 30 minutes from 6.30 to 7. And then they do have some uh, uh, pastries and treats afterwards uh, if you'd like to have some of that. Then for our congregation, uh, we usually uh, have coffee and refreshments after the service on Easter, uh, but what we're going to do this year is we're going to have coffee and refreshments and a continental breakfast before the service. So if you want to come early at starting at 9, we will have uh, some different breakfast items, but you can come at 9.30 or 9.45 and, and grab some treats as well. So you don't have to come right at 9. Uh, but our worship service begins at 10 o'clock, then after our worship service, we do have some activities for children. And so we'll have some gathering activities at 11.15, and then the egg hunt will start at 11.30. And so far, it looks like it's going to be fantastic weather. Uh, so please pass the word around to neighbors or grandchildren that we do have an egg hunt at 11.30. And uh, also invite them to come to the 10 o'clock Easter service as well. So that is all the logistics for this week. And uh, my next note is that Bernie has an announcement. Good morning, everyone. We just finished a beautiful hymn, 
all glory, laud, and honor. It is truly a day to praise Jesus as this holy week begins. But we also need to express a bit of glory and honor to Pastor Brad, who is now Reverend Dr. Brad Busick. Brad has passed his requirements for his doctorate in ministry from Fuller Theological Seminary. The title of Brad's dissertation is quite a mouthful. <laughs> Connecting neighbors with food and love, building community at a faith-related food pantry. The key words here, food and love. In the abstract section of his dissertation, I believe you said this, Brad. This project is not about survival of a congregation or becoming more effective in distributing soup and sandwiches to as many people as possible. Rather, it is about creating opportunities for social connection and adopting a food ministry to be seen as an extension of God's call for life together in beloved community. Those are such beautiful words. And we certainly see what has happened to our church in our community because of your dreams and hopes, Brad. This has been a journey for you, and now you can reap the rewards, Brad, of all your hard work, the rewards, putting it all together, all the knowledge and teachings, and making a difference, which oddly enough means more work more food, and more love. We have a couple of gifts to mark this accomplishment. First of all, your very own Dr. Mug. <laughs> May you be reminded of this. The Latin word for doctor is docere, which means to teach. When you use the mug, be reminded that as a doctor, you will teach by your words, actions, and deeds. We also know there must have been times when working on your paper or doing research took you away from things you really enjoy, like your personal time off and time with Amy and Ben and Phoebe. We have a couple of gift cards we hope you will use to enjoy life and enjoy being with your loved ones. And one last thing, can we pray with and for you, Brad? Um, that would be nice, thanks. Let us pray. On this happy day, Lord, we thank you for the knowledge gained and the learning experiences you have given Brad. You have been his helper and his strength, and we pray that you continue to let your Holy Spirit be with him. Brad has the knowledge. So will you show him now how to use the knowledge wisely and find a way to somehow make the world we live in a little bit better place? Make life with its problems a little bit easier to face. Grant Brad faith and courage and pur pur put purpose into his days. Show him how to serve you in new and effective ways, using his gifts in service to others. May his education, his knowledge, and his skills find their true fulfillment as he continues to learn how to do your will in his service to you and to this church community and the surrounding area. Empower Brad to walk into the future with faith, hope, and great love, guided by your light, so that he may use his talents to, in the words of St. Ignatius Loyola, Go forth and set the world on fire. Amen. Congratulations, Brad. So, yeah, thank you, Janet and Bernie. And I did start this process in, at the end of 2018. So it's been a long road. And so I defended the dissertation on Tuesday. Uh, but 
I want to say that like I didn't do this for me, I did this for you. And so the project really is about this church and this community. And uh, I didn't write this just to write this. I hope that it actually helps equip us uh, to better minister to the people around us. And so I do have, I've already given several copies of the dissertation away. If any of you want one, I do have three up here and I can make more if you want, but um, you're welcome to have, just grab some after the service. Um, and uh, so, oops, there's two left, <laughs> sorry. Um, but then the graduation ceremony will be June 7th, and so I'll be heading out of town when it, the first week of summer, so that'll be fun. Again, uh, welcome to Smith Memorial Presbyterian, and let us, uh, open our Palm Sunday service with prayer. We praise you, O God, for your redemption of the world through Jesus Christ. He entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was proclaimed Messiah and King by those who spread garments and branches along his way. Lord, just as we carry these branches, may we follow Christ on the path that he took, the way of the cross, that by dying and rising with him, we may enter into your kingdom through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. At this time, I'll invite our next scripture reader to come forward. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Willard Burks, and it is wonderful to see each and every one of you on this Palm Sunday. Our first reading today comes from Matthew 21, 1 through 11. Let us now hear the word of the Lord. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of the donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the colt, the donkey and the colt, and put their cloaks on them. And he said on them, A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowd were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Thanks be to God for this word. Amen. There are several wonderful Palm Sunday songs. So our next song is 267, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. This is another song you can wave your palm branches with if you'd like. So please stand if you're comfortable for Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. Children sing their 
be seated. <clears throat> I'm going to read a, a few passages for our call to confession and proclamation of grace that lead us into Holy Week from waving palm branches. Uh, the first, our call to confession is a reminder that after this uh, triumphant day on Palm Sunday for Jesus, that uh, he had uh, several of his disciples, um, one of them betrayed him, one of several just ran away. Peter, he did follow all the way to uh, the temple court, but then he denied him. And so as we enter a time of silent confession, um, hear these words from John 18, 15 to 17, about one of the disciples who let Jesus down. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. And then the woman said to Peter, you are not also one of his man's, this man's disciples, are you? And Peter said, I am not. So let us now enter a silent time of confession in which we uh, acknowledge that we have at different times denied being a disciple of Christ. Amen. Now, our proclamation of grace comes from John 21, 15 to 19. It's fast forwarding to uh, the evening of the resurrection. Uh, but I want you to notice that it's not only a word of grace from Jesus because he doesn't shame Peter about his denial, um, but there's also this calling um, that's part of this grace that Peter is called to do, uh, and we are too as well. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to Peter, feed my lambs. A second time he said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter felt hurt because he had said this to him the third time, mimicking the three times that he denied him. And Peter said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him again, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you that when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you'll be, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you to where you do not wish to go. And he said this to indicate the kind of death that Peter would glorify God. And after this, Jesus said to him, follow me. So again, we have this peace, we have this forgiveness through Christ, but we're also still called to follow him. And so that way of following him is a path that also leads to different forms of, of the cross. And so let us acknowledge first Jesus' wondrous gift of love, of going to the cross for us. But as we sing this, also um, pray in your heart that you might follow wherever Jesus leads, whatever type of cross that you might have to bear in your own life. And so our next hymn is a Passion hymn, moving from Palm Sunday to Passion Sunday, and it's What Wondrous Love Is This, 257. You're welcome to stand if you're comfortable. Oh, 
affirm our faith by using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together, let us affirm our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He had ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And now, my friends, let us share the peace of Christ with one another. Let's take a, just a brief moment to uh, wish each other a happy Palm Sunday and uh, share the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Brenda Heron, and I'm glad to be here with you this morning um, to read our scripture passage from Psalm 118. But first, let us pray. Empty us, great God, of all that prevents us from hearing what you want us to hear. Empty us of our preconceptions, our preoccupations, and our prejudices. Empty us that we might be filled with your spirit and your word. Empty us that we might be filled for ministry and mission. In Christ's name we pray, amen. <clears throat> Hear now the word of the Lord as it is written in Psalm chapter 118, verses 13 to 29. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I might enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. 
Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Blessed are those who hear and keep what is written in the light of Jesus, the word made flesh. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Brenda. And if any young people would like to come forward for a children's message, you're welcome to do so. I do want to uh, let parents and children know that, um, that we do not have teachers today for the children's chapel, so you'll stay with us during worship. But I do have something for y'all to do, if you want. So you're welcome to sit down. I'm going to sit on this chair because it's a little easier for me. Um, Y'all welcome to sit down if you want. You like to stand? Okay, great. Um, so uh, today I want to give you each one of these different types of branches. These are longer Palm Sunday. Can you take one? Um, these are longer branches of palm leaves. And you're welcome to take one too. Um, and what I spent about... Uh, I don't know, 36 hours doing <laughs> is trying to make this Palm Sunday cross. Yeah, and, and maybe that might uh, occupy your time during the next 20 minutes while I'm preaching <laughs> if you want to try to do this too. No, no, thank you. Um, but one of the things that I... Brenda just read a passage, Psalm 118, in which she said, I was pushed hard, but the Lord helped me. I was pushed hard, and the Lord helped me. And I, I really like that um, verse there. Because um, sometimes in life, like, we face challenges, and we're pushed hard. Do y'all you, do you understand what that means, pushed hard? Like, you had to, like, try over and over and over again, maybe to learn to ride a bike. It was really something you had, you fell down a lot of times, and, but, but uh, the Lord helped you, other people helped you. And, and so it's a reminder not to give up. And so as I'm thinking about what happened to Jesus on Holy Week, that he had a lot of uh, things that were hard for him. Some of his friends let him down. Uh, people in the crowds, uh, they cheered him, but then they made fun of him. I don't know if y'all have ever been made fun of, and that was really hard. And, and then he, he got some, he got hurt, and, uh, and then he even died on Good Friday. Um, but through it all, like, God did not ever give up on him, and he never gave up on God. And part of what we're um, remembering today is that through the trials that we face, um, even if uh, the worst thing happens to us, it's not going to be the last thing that happens to us. Because the last thing that happens to us is that God is going to help us and going to lift us up. And so as you make like a, turn this palm leaf into a cross, you can remember that it might be really hard to do this, um, uh, but. Yeah. I have a pretty good idea of what yeah. it's hard to do if I get in the wrong way snap But you can try over and over again and then maybe get some help if you need it. Um, but I do have some instructions that you can take um, back to the pews with you if you want to try. And you can have uh, other people help you if you need to. And notice that there's instructions on the front and the back. But let's see if, uh, you know, by the end of this week, you're able to make this. I think you'll, you can do it in about 10 minutes or so. Um, but let's pray. Loving God, there's so many times in life where we are pushed hard and we feel like giving up. Um, but remind us, Lord, that you do not give up on us that you will help us, and even if we fall down, you will lift us up. We pray this in Jesus' name, the one who suffered, died, and rose again. Amen.
Thank you. And then our next song is How Firm a Foundation. And so if you're comfortable, you're welcome to stand to sing that. seated. We are closing our sermon series today on the Sermon on the Mount with the passage that goes from Matthew 7, 13 to 28. And I'm going to do my best to connect the Sermon on the Mount closing to Palm Sunday and Passion Week. So listen now to Jesus' words as he closes his sermon. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree that bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. Everyone who then hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, 
The winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. Fred Craddock tells a story about a preacher who stood at the back door of the church one Sunday, greeting his departing parishioners. And one man approached him with words more than just, good sermon, good sermon, good sermon. This man approached him and said, oh my goodness, that sermon was awesome. I was so inspired by what you said. This changes everything. I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to have to do that. We just can't go home and return to life as it is. We have to change this world. This world's not right. We've got to change things. Your sermon was so good. This changes everything. Fred Craddock says that the preacher grew a little worried about this parishioner's over-enthusiasm. And the preacher said, now, Joe, don't get so worked up. I was just preaching. Well, with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, I don't think he was just preaching. I think Jesus really wanted us to drastically change our lives. As we just heard in our reading, there are two paths of living. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy. That leads to destruction, and there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. On this Palm Sunday morning, I want to first focus on the idea of the wide and narrow gate, along with the road that leads to destruction and the road that leads to life. As you may know, on Palm Sunday, Jesus entered Jerusalem, and to enter Jerusalem, you'd have to walk a certain path, and you'd have to walk through a certain gate. Rome had a certain path. Jesus had a certain path. This morning, I'd like to compare and contrast the path and the gate of Rome with the path and the gate of Jesus. If you look at the front of your bulletin, I don't have a bulletin with me in front of me, but on the front of your bulletin, you'll notice on the bottom right corner, there is a picture of a gate in Jerusalem. Uh, it's just on the front, bottom right. This is the easternmost gate in Jerusalem. It's known as the Golden Gate or the Beautiful Gate. It's the gate that immediately faces the Mount of Olives. It would be the closest gate to the Garden of Gethsemane. And this eastern gate that you see in the picture is the oldest gate uh, that you can visibly see in Jerusalem. Indeed, that gate is beautiful, but it's not exactly the gate that Jesus walked through. So sorry to get you excited about that gate. You see, this gate that you see is actually a gate that was built on top of the more ancient gate through which Jesus walked. The gate through which Jesus walked is actually kind of buried underground, and it forms the foundation of this new gate. This gate was built in the 5th century, um, that you see in the picture, but obviously Jesus lived in the first century. So you can't see the old gate anymore in which Jesus walked through on that first Palm Sunday. Uh, but this new gate, it was built on the foundation of that old gate. And it must have been a pretty good foundation because that new gate has lasted 1,500 years. Now, you might notice that this gate is sealed up. Uh, the eastern gate was shut up in 1540 on the order of Solomon, Solomon the Magnificent, the Ottoman uh, ruler. And he closed this gate out of fear that the Messiah might show up. You see, it was Jewish tradition um, since the days of Ezekiel that the Messiah would enter through the eastern gate. And so Solomon, 
uh, installed 16 feet of cement uh, to prevent this from happening again. Now, opposite this gate uh, would be the Western Gate. This is where Pontius Pilate would have entered. You see, Pontius Pilate, like many of us, he loved going to the beach. And he didn't really like the life of the city, and so he spent most of his time on the Mediterranean, on the coast, uh, where he had a nice palace, unlike most of us. But he did love the beach. And so coming from the Mediterranean, he would have to enter Jerusalem through the western gate. And during this time, it was Pilate's custom to come on Passover. And so all these events take place the first week of Passover. And so Pilate would enter Jerusalem on the first day of Passover, and he would enter with a big parade, and he'd come in with his army, his horses, his chariots, all armed with swords and their battle gear to inspire fear and awe. Now contrast this with what's happening on the easternmost gate. There's another parade. It's a totally different parade showing a totally different path of life. On the eastern side, you have Jesus coming here, riding on his donkey. There's no semblance of strength or power. It's just Jesus riding on his donkey and people finding leaves off the ground, waving at him. Pilate's entrance was strong and wide. Jesus' entrance was small and narrow. Now let me add some more detail about the contrast between the path and the gate of Rome versus the path and the gate of Christ. You might not realize this, but Rome had a gospel, and Rome actually coined the word gospel. It means good news. And for Rome, the gospel had all to do with their phrase, Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. It was the good news that they proclaimed to towns that they were invading. We're going to bring you the good news of the peace of Rome. Last year, there was a book uh, written by Tom Holland, who's an historian, and he wrote some uh, a good summary of the Roman Empire and what the Pax Romana really meant. Um, and in the book, he describes this gospel, this good news of Rome and the peace that they would bring. I want to share with you some of what uh, another writer, Steve Cuss, uh, summarized about this book from Tom Holland, about what you had to do to receive this gospel, this peace of Rome. First, you had to let Rome conquer your village. You had to turn over your young men of fighting age. Your young women would be given to the Roman soldiers. Your local leaders would have to submit to new leadership, Roman leadership. And to symbolize this gospel of this new leadership, you would have to let Rome throw a party on your main street, and they would have this triumphal procession. And every once in a while, they would do this reminder of this parade, uh, of this procession. For Rome, all of the centurions would be present for this procession. The general who conquered your village would be at the front of the procession, and they would be there with their big horses and armor displaying their strength. But at the end of the procession, they would have uh, the, the young men that they conquered and captured, and they would be walking behind in chains, and they might have some of the women that they have as slaves as well. And later, these young men might be put to death or put in slavery as well. And so Pontius Pilate coming in on Passover with his big procession was meant to remind the people that Rome is in charge. Remember, you have been conquered by Rome, but we come to bring you good news. We come to bring you the peace of Rome. But this peace had a price. First of all, you had to pay a lot of taxes. I worked on my taxes this week. I don't know if y'all have done your taxes, uh, but the Roman taxes would not allow you to save anything. And they were meant to keep you down in your place. If you couldn't pay your taxes, the tax collector would come and a centurion would come with you and they would take some things from your home or even take some of your children to be used as a slave. 
Anyhow, if you let Rome conquer your city, take your young men and young women and tax you to death, you were given the peace of Rome. And in some ways, this peace was something that people looked forward to and maybe uh, hoped that they would one day become occupants of the Roman Empire. In some ways, the peace of Rome did make life easier. It was an easier path for some because you literally had great roads. Rome was famous for their great roads and their engineering marvels. Uh, you would also have aqueducts. You would have this great system of water being delivered to your home and plus sewers taking the, the waste away from your home. And so if you let Rome take over, you know, one thing that would be easier about your life would be just water and waste would be taken care of. You would have the best toilets you could ever imagine <laughs> in the first century. It would be great. And believe me, if you lived in the first century, that would be wonderful to have really good toilets. You would also have a centralized system of law that is uniform throughout the Roman Empire. If you're traveling from one place to another place, you would know what to expect. Um, and it'd be helpful that as you did trading that you had one system of law. It's also helpful that you have one sort of language of business, business that Latin would be spoke, spoken everywhere. And although the Roman centurions, they could sometimes be cruel and harsh, it was nice to know that you are protected from barbarians coming in and invading your village. So there were some benefits to the Roman Empire, and in some ways it did make life easier. But it was a false gospel. Again, first you had to pay a heavy cost with perhaps your husband or your brother or your son or your daughter becoming a slave. And although the roads were great and the toilets were fantastic, historians said that everyday life for about 95% of the Roman population uh, was much worse than it was before they were conquered. Um, again, they were taxed a lot and taxed so much that you only had enough money to survive for the day. And so when you're praying, give us this day our daily bread, that was really a prayer that, that you prayed because that's all you could muster each and every day. For 95% of the population, each day was a day of survival where you barely had enough to eat. It was a world in which only a small percentage of people benefited from the Pax Romana, and really you worked to support the, the upper tiers of society. Most were just barely getting by. So in the Pax Romana, the good news of Rome was basically the majority paid while the minority benefited. The Roman gospel also proclaimed Caesar as Lord. In fact, Julius Caesar was declared a god, and then his adopted son, Augustus Caesar, was declared the son of God. The ancient poet Virgil wrote the day of Augustus' birth that it was a day of glad tidings and great joy for all humankind, for through the birth of Augustus comes the peace for the whole world. It sounds very similar to the, the Christmas story. The Christian gospel was a totally different path. It's a different story, and it changes everything. Jesus talks about the kingdom of God in a way that is opposite of the Roman Empire. The kingdom is about love and humility and not a hunger for more and more power, but a hunger to care for others. It's not Caesar who is Lord, but it's Jesus who is Lord and the real Son of God. Jesus was different and his path was different. The late Tim Keller once remarked that these Gospels have separate paths, promises, and payments. They have different paths, promises, and payments. For Rome, there is a path. You let them conquer you. You let them steal your children. That's the path. And the promise was peace, the Pax Romana. But for most people in the Roman Empire, they never really felt that peace because there was such a big payment. To receive the easy life, you might have to work every day with no rest. And even then, you might lose some of your family. You had to sacrifice a lot to get Rome's peace. But it really was a false peace. 
And Caesar and all the senators and centurions, they're the ones that benefited. But again, contrast that with Christ. The path is different, the promise is different, and the payment is different. In the Christian gospel, you don't have to pay to receive the promises of God. It's not you who pay. It's the opposite of that. It's God who sacrifices for you. It's God who's on your side and not against you. There is a story in the Hebrew scriptures from Genesis 28, of which many of us are familiar, that I think connects with this and with our passage from the Sermon on the Mount. In Genesis 28, there's this passage about Jacob, and he was running away, and he felt like everybody was against him, and he was just struggling to survive. He felt alone and like the world was crashing down. I know many of us sometimes feel alone and like the world's crashing down on us. And then he had this vision Jacob had this vision when he realized that as the world was crashing down upon him, he wasn't alone, that God was with him. And he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. No, let me back up. He said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not realize it. And so like when the waves were crashing upon him, he realized he wasn't alone, that God was there with him all along. But then in the next verse, which I find fascinating here, he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. This is the gate of heaven. When Jacob realized that God was with him all along and was on his side, he saw the gate of heaven. Perhaps the gate that we seek, it's not this physical gate in Jerusalem. Maybe it's simply the recognition of God's presence when we feel alone and when the waves of life are crashing upon us. Jesus once said, I am the gate. Perhaps this gate is a reminder to be in a living relationship with Jesus who will never leave you nor forsake you. And perhaps that's why Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, it's not a matter of you just crying, Lord, Lord, It's a relationship. It's a relationship when you know Jesus and Jesus knows you, and it's this long and narrow journey. It's not the gospel of Rome where one in authority has no feelings or care about your life at all. It's the gospel of Christ where God knows you and loves you intimately. Again, you don't have to pay to receive the promises of God. It's not you who pay, it's the opposite. It's God who sacrifices. It's the God who's on your side and not against you. The promise of the gospel of Christ, it's not a false gospel. In our reading from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous woods. I wonder if Jesus had more than just in mind than just sort of the the charlatans who are uh, preaching. But I wonder if he was thinking about the whole system of the Roman Empire as a false prophet who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous woods. They give you this, this false sense of security, but really what they advocate destroys your life. Perhaps this could also apply to the false prophets in our own lives. Do this and you'll have peace. Or spend every waking hour at work. Or worry about how you dress or how you look and you'll be a success. Or accumulate more and more and then you will finally be happy. But if you think about it, all those things that we often focus on, do they really bear fruit? I believe that the Sermon on the Mount is about a way of life, a way of living. It's a way of life that's in contrary to society and what we might feel like gives us peace. It's in contrary to what's powerful and popular. The way of Jesus is a way that is not going to be easy. 
Jesus said, to the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And this word hard in the Greek, it's the same Greek word that you'll see in other passages where Jesus talks about trouble or tribulation. When you follow Jesus, you're going to be walking through trouble. You're going to be walking through tribulation. It's not going to be easy. But in the end, it will lead to life. Rome promises this easy life, but it's really a life that leads to more pain and suffering. And although the path of Jesus will definitely lead as well to some pain and suffering, it doesn't stop there. It's the only path that I know that gets you through that pain and suffering. Jesus said, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it was built on the rock. In conclusion, I can imagine Jesus saying to us and to you and to me after contemplating the entire Sermon on the Mount, I can imagine Jesus saying to us, Look, I'm not just preaching. I'm not just preaching. These are not just words to hear and then go home as if nothing should change. These are words that lead to life where everything changes. My friends, it's not an easy road, but it is a road that I believe truly brings life and hope and peace and joy. It's a road that brings life through every flood and every storm. And it may seem daunting to follow that road, but the good news is that God is on that road with us. Surely God is with us even when we don't even know it. God is not only with you, he's for you, and God's not looking for you to pay. God is not trying to scare you or to shame you. Instead, God shows his love this holy week, by paying it all. Amen. At this time, I invite the ushers to come forward for the offering, and you are also welcome to join in the singing of Build My Life as well. couple prayer requests to add to your prayers this week. 
Steve and Felice DeMarker have a close friend named Royce who has just been told that he has prostate cancer. So please keep Royce and your, his family and friends in your prayers. And I received a prayer from uh, Bernie Mueller um, that uh, a friend of her family's named Dan Peterson was killed at his farm last week. And so please pray for uh, Dan Peterson and his family. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Lead us, O God, in the way of Christ. Give us courage to take up our cross and in full reliance upon your grace, help us to follow him. Lord, help us to love you above all else and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, demonstrating this love in deed and in word by the power of your Holy Spirit. Loving God, this week as we watch the news, we especially pray for the people in Haiti as they deal with so much gang violence. And we pray for the people of Russia after yesterday's horrific terrorist attack at the Crocus City Hall. Lord, we pray, we continue to pray for the people of Ukraine, Israel, and Gaza. And we pray for our own community and country. Lord, we pray for your comfort, your healing, your peace, and your hope. Hear us now as we lift up the prayers of our hearts, either out loud or silently. We pray all this in great confidence in the one who suffered, died, and rose again. Jesus, who taught us to pray together as his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our charge and blessing comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 to 6. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture... See, I am laying a stone in Zion, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Amen. Our final song is a, is a new uh, song that's uh, fairly popular on the Christian radio. It's called Firm Foundation, He Won't. So let us uh, stand and learn this new song called Firm Foundation. <clears throat> I'm not held by my own strength Cause I built my 